Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to talk on this exciting subject. The uh, topic today is, of course, stability testing, and there were some excellent remarks by Gail with the FDA on their keynote opening talk this morning. And I thought it, this paralleled and, and, and went well into the, the original one from going from the original discussion into this from beyond you stating there's a lot of interest in stability testing or beyond use date or expiration date or in use depending on which arena you're operating in. Today I'm going to talk, uh, focus more on the science and technical aspect, but the science and the compliance uh, is often looked at. So the goal would be to look at some of the regulatory guidelines from different perspectives, as well as really looking at some of the science of stability studies, including some of the factors that affect stability. And then we'll end up with some practical applications from the regulatory 503A and 503P guidelines. Again, I think it, it works better in an ideal world I think when that science or that evidence-based is hand in hand with compliance and they work together, the outcomes turn out uh, much better. And so the goal is to look at some of the science and, and, and say, and look at some of the regulatory based upon that science and discuss that uh, in today's topic. We know the general definition from USP 1191 uh, is the extent to which a product or preparation retains within the specified limits and throughout its period of storage and use the same properties or characteristics that it possessed at the time of the compounding. But essentially, you want your drug product or preparation to remain in the exact same uh, condition as it was with at the time that it was made. Another definition of the beyond you state from 795 is a little bit, uh, it's just basic as saying the date which a compound should not be used, determined from the date of preparation. So they're essentially saying the date at which it should be in use. And you see that from the 503B and some of their definitions from the FDA in regards to the in use. So we'll also talk about some of the nomenclature of stability study or BUD or expiration date and explain that. Uh, throughout this talk today. You know, I think the guidance, you're, you'll see a lot of the regulatory and guidance documents that are out there. And the emphasis on stability or beyond you state, those references have been out for many years, actually decades. And you see the ICH has listed guidance documents and ICH stands for that International Council for Harmonization of technical requirements for the pharmaceutical for human use. And then the FDA guidance documents. And we'll go through a couple, a few of those or a couple of those. And then USP has many general chapters on uh, where BUD or stability studies and as discussed throughout that particular chapter. So I wanted to provide that as a reference material for that. And you can sort of see they all are encompassing and working together. And that's the nice thing about the ICH is that harmonization that you're seeing those drugs since it has been a more of a global, uh, a global perspective. Some of the guidelines from ICH, we look at the Q1A and the Q2. It's actually Q1 is a very good one. It's talking about the stability testing of those new drug substances. Whereas Q2 talks more about the validation of the analytical procedure. And it goes into quite a bit of detail on what parameters and how to actually validate a uh, analytical procedure. And then in QC, you see more uh, test prep uh, procedures and criteria for both a new drug substance and a new drug product. And then I think 6B is interesting in that with the event and the development in the last decade of protein and peptides or, or larger uh, products, such as biological product, products, you're seeing specifications listed for it. And I can tell you that is a challenge to performing testing on biological products due to the nature of the testing and the assays itself. Uh, a couple, I just pulled out a few of the chapter verses for each of those respective sections. So you see here in ICH, uh, Q21 is talking about specificity. 
and the importance of stressing the conditions. And again, it mis mentions light, heat, humidity, <clears throat> the acid base, and oxidation. And you're going to see that throughout the talk. The FDA, it has guidance documents, uh, both from the CMC, the Chemistry Manufacture Manufacturing Control Section, and it specifically is looking at those method validation and analytical procedures. The CEDAR, that Center for Drug Evaluation Research, you see it's a, a good chapter that's uh, frequently referred to as the validation for chromatographic methods. And then even the GMP or the CGMP, excuse me, the current good manufacturing practices, specific, specifically under the 503B, you can, uh, there's a lot of references in it for establishing the uh, stability of that particular product. Some of the ones that we pulled out, the FDA guidance, this is a good one. <clears throat> it's saying those degradation <clears throat> or stress studies, uh, and it should, it's looking at the products. You're looking not just the drug substance, but the drug products of the acid and base hydrolysis, the thermal degradation, the phototolysis, or, or uh, and oxidation. And it's talking about for that drug substance and for the active ingredient in the drug product should be provided. And ultimately, you're wanting to ensure that they do not interfere with the connotation or the concentration of that active analyte. We'll talk about that and I'll show some chromatograms later on and give some specifics. Another good guidance from the FDA uh, for industry regarding stability testing of drug substances and drug products. It clearly communicates stress testing helps to determine the intrinsic stability characteristics. And I think it's so important to look at by stressing that drug product or preparation, it gives you an indication under what conditions that that molecule or that substance will fall apart or break apart or degrade. A good guidance document that we pulled out from CEDAR, that Center for Drug Evaluation Research was that again, we refer frequently in a laboratory setting to that validation of those chromatographic methods. Looking specific at that drug substance testing under section one of specificity and selectivity. And later on, I present a slide of all the parameters in a valid stability indicating method and I highlight specificity because that's the, that's the crust of the matter. That's the heart of it. It's wanting to show that there's no interference with the analyte from the other extraneous components or degradants or related impurities, but that they're well resolved or well separated and you can quantitate and we'll show some chromatograms for that. USP, it has a lot of good chapters. Also again, and here's a few chapters. The ones that I might wanna to refer to or are bring attention to is 1191, that's stability consideration and dispensing practices. That 1225, that frequently used in most laboratories across the country today, whether you're testing commercial products, hospital products, or 503B or 503A, the validation of those compendial procedures. And so there's a lot of good chapters in USP referring back to stability. So here we've presented several, both from ICH, FDA, and USP regulatory or guidance documents for stability. Again, I'm pulling out this specificity from 1225, which we just referred to, and it's saying, if an impurity or degradation product standards are unavailable, it's important to demonstrate that by subjecting them to stress conditions such as light, heat, humidity, acid base, and oxidation. And I give an example of an impurity because that's often occurring during the manufacturing process. So it's important there are other impurities that one would need to look at, as uh, Gail had mentioned in the original one for methanol that's going on in today's issues as an impurity in the hand sanitizers. So compounding, we all know, let's look at what is the difference between compounding and manufacturing. And we know from this audience, the, the compounding is based on that traditional patient physician pharmacist triad that it's made extemporaneously and it's not commercially available. Whereas those manufactured drugs, are, our products are actually commercially prepared and they fall under that FDA guidance. Some regulation for the CGMP, that's, we know that's been developed over years of industrial and commercial experience. 
if they're enforced by the FDA, it's based upon that Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, and that's changed or updated as new technology or that scientific data supports it. It applies to all medicines and some equipment that's commercially available. Some other guidance that was important to adhere to is that 21 CFR Part 11, 211. The primary, it's the primary standard for preparing, testing, and release of those drug products. And general, it's, uh, it, it's, it's general enough to give firms the flexibility to set up their own production, testing, and monitoring methods. But the caveat is it carries a responsibility to follow those methods. So moving from the regulatory aspect and some of the chapter verse and guidance documents that we have to looking a little bit more at the science. And it's almost like a spaghetti. It seems like when you discuss it, you see everything's entangled. There's a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas, a lot of terms, a lot of nomenclature that is a little confusing. And so the goal of today's uh, discussion is to sort of sort it out and, and to give some order or structure or control to it. So hopefully through this talk, we can sort out some of the science of stability testing. And looking at that, there are other types of stability other than microbiological. We look a lot of emphasis, both from the regulatory perspective, as well as conducting a stability study is microbiology. But I wanted to bring attention to there are many other types of stability and it should not be done in a vacuum. Uh, a lot of information and concern and risk is based upon microbiological, but I, I don't think we should ignore the physical uh, stability or just as important as a chemical, the degradation. And then we may ignore the idea of the toxicological aspects of a degradant that have toxic byproducts. And then another form is the product that's being given to a patient. The ultimate goal is it therapeutic. So you want a safe and effective product or a compounded preparation given to that patient, regardless how it's made from the compounding pharmacist to the 503B uh, facility to the CGMP commercial entity. And it's important to look at and understand the science and measure these quality attributes in the process of making that drug that's being administered to the patient. Some of the chemical pro properties that we may look at would be the drug stability or concentration known as potency. Many people will use the term potency. I feel that that's probably a better way to say is what is the concentration of the active ingredient? Potency in many pharmacology or other areas of the science and pharmaceutical sciences is also referred to the effect based upon the concentration of that. But it's not uncommon to use the word potency, and that's different than looking at the true stability of that product using a stability indicating method. Another very important chemical property that I wanted to bring out and stress today is the importance of looking at preserved products and looking at the, preser the preservative stability. If you have a multi-dose vial or multi-dose substance, it's very important to understand, does the preservative itself maintain stability? And that can be tested not just from a 51 anti-preservative effectiveness, but also the chemical testing of the preservative itself. Another area would be the pH and how does that affect it? So these are some chemical properties that one would want to look at when establishing the beyond you state or stability of substances. Some common physical properties is the appearance. Particulate matter, we know from the last decade and in, in the last few years, issues of even syringes where the uh, silicone reacted with the oil, uh, the, the silicone oil reacted with an ingredient that caused some particulate matter in syringes. And so there's a lot of investigations that are are conducted and, and out of specs that are reviewed and looked at scientifically based upon not just chemical properties, but also physical properties that can result of that. And then very important, the microbiological properties. We know and we discuss and we look at frequently in beyond use dating, the sterility tests, the endotoxin, and then also the container closure integrity. We talk about chapter uh, and some of the, the uh, 
slides later on the importance of container closure integrity. And we'll talk about some extractables and leachables or absorption. And I think that's an important issue. You might have data from the literature from a stability or beyond you state, but to turn around and extract that data based upon one's professional knowledge or lack thereof, and then apply it to a different container closure, which that container closure could compromise the integrity of the ability for that to proliferate microbial organisms. So container closure integrity is another important aspect of stability. Just as we talk about the microbial limits for non-sterile products, sterility tests, and there are many microbial tests that are utilized that are included non in, in non-sterile products. And then, as we mentioned earlier, preservative effectiveness is an important quality attribute. Okay, looking at some different drugs may also require different test methods. I think traditionally, for decades, we've used small molecule. But as you started looking at larger molecule and looking at cell therapy and gene therapy, and I mean, as we're looking at vaccines and with the pandemic and even the, diff the drugs and the treatment and the biologics, it may require a different test method to look at for stability studies or determining beyond use datings. So we know that there's no universal method for one size fits all. Small molecules, we know the theory uh, that it would work if present. Often, HPLC is used, that high performance liquid chromatography or high pressure liquid chromatography, it was known, uh, combined with the UV is a common method for conducting stability studies. But nowadays there are many other, such as mass spectrometry, triple quads, and a host of instrumentation that can be utilized, but it should be based upon the molecule itself. Large molecules, as I would just mentioned, looking at the protein and peptides. You may not know it if, if, if they work and when they're present. So the, also the activity measurement uh, should be looked at. So, what is a stability indicating method? A stability indicating method is a validated analytical procedure that accurately and precisely measures the drug without interference from the process impurities, excipients, and degradation products. We often talk about stress with that or de uh, the degradant of acid base heat peroxide and UV, but I, I want to encourage you to look at the excipients can have an effect. We'll discuss that on some other areas, like we know uh, oxytocin and uh, in the, in the presence of uh, lactated ringers. So the excipients can affect the degradation of the active pharmaceutical uh, substance and other impurities from the manufacturing process. So an appropriate analytical method should be chosen based upon that structural chemical or biological properties of that particular active ingredient. Here I'm going to show some uh, illustrates. I think a picture illustrates it nicely. This is an example of a chromatogram. It's an older chromatogram from a laboratory, but it must be validated for that exact product being tested to eliminate interference. And I was wanting to say, how can you best illustrate the co-elution of the peaks that might be hidden under a peak? So we injected this twice and then it overlaid those chromatograms and you can see under the exact same conditions that you may not see a hidden peak. And I wanted to bring that up and you can see here an, a good example of a co-elution peak of a product that has degraded or interfered. And so that method is important to separate it out. Here is a, a chromatogram that actually separates that this was a particular EDTA from a degradant. And so when it was stressed, it, you can see if you, the method has to be optimized to separate that active from the degradant. And that's the whole basis or heart of a stability indicating method. They also can be fairly complex. Here's a substance that is uh, alprostadil. It's often seen in a, a compounded preparation. And it's at a very, very low concentration, maybe even the microgram range when you may dealt with the milligram in a typical dosage form. So a thousand times much smaller, but yet you have to pull out that needle in the haystack and accurately measure and pre-precise 
that particular chemical entity. And this is an example of a chromatogram that it's important to be able to evaluate that drug of interest without the interference of the others. Force degradation. So what do we mean by perforce degradation? That's performed during the method development. Is the purpose is to create degradants of that drug and excipients. You develop a method that separates all those degradants from the drug peak. There's a lot of discussion in articles and books written on stability and force degradation. And really, you would like for it to understand the condition that which is going to be stored so you can mimic the, the worst case scenario at which that drug is going to be stored in its condition. Here, I wanted to bring up different stresses have different degradants. And so this is the same compound stressed under different conditions. One normally would expect it to degrade under heat and humidity. But here, I think this may have been nicarpine. We did this many, many years ago. But how you can see UV light will break that compound down, whereas typically heat and humidity would not. Thus, you would not, you would either want to store this chemical entity in a, 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 a brown uh, or amber vial. So uh, there's many conditions and why it's important to know what or how or why that active pharmaceutical substance will degrade or decompose when stressed. And so the purpose of stressing is to give you an idea what's going to happen under those most stressful conditions. Even the impurities, I think it's important to look at the process impurities. Process impurities uh, or related uh, impurities are known, are leftovers from the manufacturing process. For instance, when you're looking at USP and you're doing monograph or you're actually doing testing on the pure bulk substance or pure powder, there, the original manufacturer may have some leftover products and those related compounds or related substances need to be known. And so part of the method should be included in looking at those related impurities. And a perfect example that's so timely is the, the talk the issue that Gail brought out this morning of methanol and ethanol or isopropanol. You do not want toxic or impurities present in your drug that, or product that you're being utilized to mitigate that safety for that particular patient. This is a, some chromatograms that's been used in many publications that came out of our laboratory, oh, probably 10 to 20 years ago. And the left is just an example. That figure one is an example of a chromatogram of a non-stability indicating method that is, uh, that is looking at a potency. The chromatogram figure two is showing you a very poor chromatogram, a non-stability indicating method. Actually, it's not a suitable method. So if you're seeing chromatography that looks like that, that's not appropriate. It's not suitable and not applicable. Figure three, they're trying, you can enhance it. You're trying to further optimize the conditions in that HPLC on the bottom left of your screen. And you can see you're trying to resolve it out, but you still don't have baseline resolution. So analytically, you want to be able to separate with baseline resolution, meet all the criteria, as, as you see in figure four, where you can see the analyte on the right and the degradant on the left. So that's the ideal situation from a chromatogram using a stability indicating method to be able to analyze and quantitate that peak of interest without the interference of either an impurity or a degradant. What are some of the parameters? This is getting a little deep, I know, but basically you go through quite a few parameters when you're looking at an HPLC method for stability indicating methods. We know that the resolution, the tailing of the peak, the relative standard deviation, the column efficiency, all of those are parameters that have to be met, which we call system suitability at the very beginning before you even begin running your samples. Linearity, which we know that needs to fall within a certain concentration range, that the precision, we understand precision is repeatability and accuracy is how close can you get to the true target. Ruggedness and robustness is are very important and often misunderstood. So ruggedness is really 
consistent results with an example like multiple chemists over multiple in instruments. Robustness is with reliable data with deliberate changes to that method. So let's say it's one mil and instead of a one mil a minute, it comes off at 0.95 mil or 1.05. What can you still get accurate results? These are all parameters within the method that needs to be evaluated to ensure you're getting accurate and scientific valid data. Sensitivity, and then I highlighted as I spoke, specificity. One for a stability indicating method will subject the active pharmaceutical ingredient as well as the drug product to the acid base heat peroxide in UV and even freeze thaw. If that drug is going to be free, frozen and then thawed and frozen and thawed, you need to mimic or duplicate that because there are some instances where the chemical entity will change based upon a freeze thaw. Another uh, some tests that are included in that stability uh, study of that might be an assay, preservative quantification. That is an example when we were talking earlier, it's important, for instance, benzyl alcohol, if it's utilized or another preservative, it needs to be looked at, pH, the visual inspection, particulate matter. Those are all documented tests that should be in, performed on stability of a sterile injectable. Others that might be utilized is in stability study for a sterile, might be the microbial test such as sterility from USP 71, endotoxin, preservative effectiveness, and again, not ignoring the, the importance of container closure integrity, which we spoke about earlier. Accelerated data. A lot of people will ask, what do we mean by accelerated data? It's important to conduct your stability study under the conditions at which and temperature at which it's going to be normally stored. But to get data in a faster fashion, one can run it under accelerated conditions. ICH, USP, and FDA guidelines typical may be 25 for room temp or, and 40 for relative humidity. It's plus or minus 2 degrees C, plus or minus 5 relative humidity. But for instance, if the product is stored refrigerated, Running that refrigerated and at 25, which is the ambient temperature, then your 25 would be acting as the accelerated stability. So that temperature is based upon a higher temp at which the temperature is normally performed or the stability study. So it's accelerated study is not always 40 degrees. What are some criteria to consider when assigning a, buy, a BUD? Well, this is taken from USP 795. I'd like to go back to the source documents if possible to show where the original, but this is in many, uh, many pieces of literature. But there are many things to consider when assigning BUD or that can affect BUD. You assign your BUD based upon the scientific data but things that can affect the stability or beyond use date or the expiration date or the end use time are things such as drug and its degradation mechanisms. Is it have a propensity to decompose? Um, the dosage form itself and its components in that dosage form, the potential for microbial proliferation. And there's a lot of emphasis put on the sterility or the microbial proliferation. I just want to encourage you to look at there's other areas besides that not to do it in a vacuum and make a decision on, on that. Containers in which the preparation is packaged, that container closure integrity, very important. The expected storage conditions also is an important criteria to consider uh, for determining that uh, and looking at the expiration date or stability. And then also the intended duration of therapy. What are some of those factors affecting that compounded product stability? As we looked at that formulation, Doug, form, you're not just looking at that drug itself or the active pharmaceutical uh, substance, but that concentration. We have seen under high concentrations that would cause a problem, whereas a low concentration you may not. So when conducting that stability study of known drug products or preparations or formulas at varying concentrations, you will want to bracket that. You'll also want to look at the excipients and the other vehicles. I'm thinking of lactated ringers, as we mentioned in, in the oxytocin example of the IV. Uh, that 
accelerates that. That's been in the literature for many years and when conducting those studies, it's very evident. Container closures. I give a slide here, a subsequent slide where we'll be discussing the um, extractables and leachables. And that's an example of the container closure and how it can affect the concentration of the active ingredient. The storage conditions, another very important issue. Other areas, and these, I think if you perhaps you go back to your long time ago looking in the pharmaceutics class or uh, the pharmaceutical science class, that pH, I think we often forget about the pharmaco uh, physical chemical properties that are occurring in, I think Kim may be discussing some, Kim Kiefer will be maybe discussing some of this in her talk, but this is the, the type of thing that the manufacturer or a, a commercial entity would go through when they're developing that drug formulation. But the particle size, we see the very importance of it, the pH, the solubility, the solvent system composition, that, uh, that's a very important issue that we've seen that will affect it. The compatibility of anions and cations, even the strength of those ionic strength. Again, the primary container, some additional specific chemical additives that might, might be added or taken away, and then molecular binding and the diffusion of the drugs and the excipients. All of these are factors that are going to affect the stability that we may take for granted. But if you change one of those variables, it's going to change the science, change the stability, potentially change that. And that's why you want to test it and physically look at it. Okay, I've talked about this slide a couple of times. The container closure integrity is very important and some factors that affect that are extractables. And I wanted to define extractables, leachables, and absorption because this is a, a, a phenomenon, this is an a, a area that's often misunderstood. An extractable are compounds that can be extracted out of that container closure system when in the presence of a solvent. Whereas a leachable, it's a subset of that extractable, is a compound that leaches into the drug product from the container closure itself as a result of direct contact with that formulation. So you can sort of see the flow of the impurity going from one to the other. And then even the absorption, is that drug absorbing to the package? Is it absorbing to the container closure, to the lid, to the, you know, what is the uh, septum? All of those are important issues and why the importance of container closure integrity is important to the stability of a, uh, of a product or preparation. Storage conditions, that temperature as we looked at. Are there temperature excursions and for how long? Why? Heat, humidity, oxygen, carbon dioxide, those other packaging materials. I wanted to bring up here at the end uh, some pictures. This is we plotted. Sometimes you don't always see that degradant, but when you plot over time, this was a 40 week study of an excipient. When you, that excipient, initially you didn't see it, but as that product was tested over time, you saw the increase degradant increase in concentration, even though it was very, very small, but you see from a 0.000% of it down up to maybe 0.07%, but very small amount, but it was an important because it was a toxic byproduct. Another example, we actually plotted the degradation of the product divided by the active pharmaceutical ingredient concentration as a percent in the ratio. And here are two of them. When that product is stored in light, you can see how it, it's, the degradation is greatly uh, is occurring and continuing to decrease. Whereas that product, it likes to be in the dark. So the necessity to have uh, a stable product that often is indicated from the data obtained from the stability study or beyond you stating, and therefore the products may need to be stored in a dark or ember vial. So all these variables, this is an example of over time, the importance of looking at your drug preparation. Looking at the 503A, here's some guidelines we, as that we, as we discussed earlier, a 503A, uh, it needs to be in compliance with the USP. Uh, using bulk, approved bulk substances from the USP or approved by the FDA. There is definitions in 795 for the maximum 
BUD. And this is saying in the absence of stability information, why I wanted to bring this particular chart to you, you can see based upon the matrix of a water containing, a non aqueous you get longer, you get up to six months. The BUD is not later than the time remaining until the earliest expiration date of any API or six months, whichever is earlier. But the goal I wanted to show you is the greater amount of water, the greater propensity of potential degradation or microbial proliferation. So there's some of that science behind that. In Indian oil sepsis, uh, the BUD is not later than 14 days when stored a uh, water containing oral, not oil, oral formulation is um, 14 days stored at uh, controlled cold temperatures. So you can just sort of see water, you have a lower amount of time. non aqueous formulation, you have a, a greater amount of time. 797, it's gone through a, a lot of, of, of scrutiny. In the absence, this is the existing 797 from USP. We know 797 came out with some guidance documents or it, uh, proposed changes. I believe it was appealed and now it's gone back to, uh, there's been several meetings and look at and the stakeholders are having input. And presently, these are the conditions which has gone back to the traditional 797 before the proposed changes and the new expert committee are looking at that. But this is the storage conditions from the existing 797 looking at the three areas of risk, low, medium, and high, versus the proposed when they reduced them to two areas of risk. Anyway, the, in the absence of passing the sterility test, beyond you stating the following storage periods cannot be exceeded. The goal here is you see under freezer conditions, of course, you get the longer shelf life. Again, high risk, refrigerated three, up to low risk, 14 days, and then following that same line of thought from the science, low risk, 48 hours, high risk, just uh, one day or 24 hours for ambient. 503B, the stability and the expiration date. This is an important issue here in that the stability program must be established. A stability test result must be determined to determine the appropriate storage and expiration date and the product must retain its quality and remain sterile throughout that entire expiration date. These you can take directly from the guidance from the FDA on the 503B. They give explicit instructions and guidance from the 503B on you stating expiration date assignment. And these are some examples of that that are brought out. The agency does not intend to take action against outsourcing facilities regarding stabilities if, and then they give you several bullets. So I'm going to just bring a couple of the, the bullets. The beyond you state provides reasonable assurance of chemical and physical stability. And then I, again, the importance of microbiological stability. There's other areas that we learned in the science in the earlier part of this uh, discussion. The beyond you state is used as the expiration date. Actually, we'll talk about the in use state. 503B stability guidelines, if terminally sterilized and no sterility, not more than 14 days. If aseptically processed with no sterility testing, not more than 24 hours at, at the control room temperatures, not more than three days at refrigerated, or not more than 45 days between the frozen. If each batch has completed the sterility testing before release, the BUD may be extended beyond the date of test completion by the following indications of 14 days. So you can sort of again see the, the the greater the chance for microbial proliferation, the less the BUD or beyond use dating time is present. I think the procedures for beyond use state need to be reliable. They should be meaningful and they should be very specific to your product, your container closure, and for that formulation. They should have the same final product container and labeling. These are outlined in that 503 guidance documents. They must be representative of the batch under the suitable conditions. I wanted to bring up another point here. In the 503B, it's more of the GMP-like. So as you're going through compounders who may just be making one product for one patient for under one specific or for within a state would follow that 503A. But as you more move more toward that GMP under commercial conditions, you're looking at that 503B. 
Here you're seeing three batches are required for a stability study if one is conducted. <clears throat> That's more in line with the commercial and how we run samples for stability and beyond you stating for, for uh, under FDA full GMP uh, process. 503B in use times can be used as the expiration date. And this is taken directly out of the guidance composed of one or more drug products approved. Or they're saying it can't, they're using the word in use time as another word for as can be used as the expiration date. 503B in use times, if two or more products are used, the in use time should be the shortest of the specified labels. I think they, that has been brought about in several different discussions and will continue to be so, but it's the shorter of the two products. I wanted to give a couple examples before we open it up and conclude today uh, for questions. And this is an example of some tests that would be for a sterile injectable aqueous solution with a preservative. So the appearance, you can see that you would run it at test zero, 30, 60, 90. This would be a six month test over five time points. You'd ex it's important to test the pH, look at the particulate matter, look at the active, the, the test for the, uh, as well as the benzoyl al alcohol potency. What I wanted to and use this choice is look at the, in the uh, antimicrobial effectiveness and the benzyl alcohol potency. So this, you are chemically testing the preservative as well as conducting the antimicrobial effectiveness test, which is the microbiological test of 51. Another example for let's say methylcobalamin, a CGMP stability study design might be a parental. It would include the, um, it's, in, it's important to be in an amber vial, refrigerated, and those respective time points. And here's the test that might would include for it, the appearance, the pH, the assay for the methylcobalamin, the importance of a particulate matter, as well as, again, the benzyl alcohol or the preservative, the sterility, the endotoxin, the micro antimicrobial effectiveness, and the container closure integrity. So this group of tests you see, you're looking at your container closure. There's an error in this slide. It should be done at the beginning and at the end. I see zero. It should be zero and then 90, and then two time points subsequently. But you, sh you should see, uh, we're looking at the container closure. You're looking at the antimicrobial effectiveness, both from microbial testing, as well as the chemical chromatographic testing, as well as the active of the methylcobalamin assay using a stability indicating method and then looking at some of the physical. So this would be a typical stability design for a CGMP study. I've listed some references for you and at this time I want to thank you for your time today and open it up for questions.